Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net and welcome to another comic art demonstration. In this tutorial, we will be continuing on with Goliath, a comic book character concept I created for a title called Replicator by Rob Arnold. Now, as you can see on the screen in front of you, most of Goliath's concept is complete. We've placed in a majority of the line work for his design. We've even rendered out the miniguns on either side of his body. But now it's time to turn our attention to and focus on the ammo belts that are extending out from the side of those miniguns, curving around and up into the back of Goliath. And as they do, you'll notice that there's a certain amount of three-dimensionality that we've applied to them. There's thickness to these 3D ammo belts. They're basically three-dimensional strips, is what I like to think of them as. And what makes them extremely difficult to draw in a technical sense is that they actually twist around as they follow that curved path from the outside of the miniguns and up into the back of Goliath. In some instances, we can see the sides of those ammo belts. And in other instances, we can see the tops and sometimes the bottom. And so what we need to do in order to get them looking right on the page is really think about their form and the flexibility of that form shape as it is conformed to the coiled path that it is following. This is one of the reasons as to why I have an extreme amount of difficulty drawing these ammo belts up. They require a lot of time to outline, to render, and if they aren't exact, what ends up happening is a whole lot of erasing. And I had to go back to the drawing board and start again, which is exactly what you are going to see later on here throughout this demonstration. And it is one of the many reasons as to why for the rest of this video, we will be focused just specifically on these ammo belts. Now, it doesn't make for a lot of entertaining watching, but it is one of those things where even though you might see my art and you'd say, hey, this guy has at least some level of skill, there are still times where I run into extreme difficulty and make some of the worst mistakes along the road to the ultimate presentation of my illustrations. Before I can call anything done, being the perfectionist that I am, and extremely meticulous when it comes to my art, I've always got to go back and tweak the most minute flaws within the work that I produce. And this was certainly no exception. And it's almost embarrassing to admit to you exactly how much time I spent on these minigun ammo belts. But I persisted and I made sure that I continued reworking them until I was finally happy with the end result, what I was seeing on the page. Most people wouldn't be that patient. And a lot of the time when my family has looked at my work or my friends, people who don't really understand what goes into a finished comic book illustration with this degree of detail, they always say to me, Clayton, I'd never have the patience to sit there and draw something out for that amount of time with that amount of intricacy. And I totally get it. It was an absolutely grueling process for me to go in, do all this work. As you can see, there is a lot of detail already that I'm putting into these ammo belts along that three-dimensional strip. What I've placed in is these extrusions, these bumps along the way that run horizontally along that 
coiled shape that the ammo belts take on. And each and every one of those little embossments, I guess you could call them, need to be set at a specific distance to one another. They need to appear even, even though as that three-dimensional strip of ammo belt shifts and transitions in terms of the foreshortening that's applied to it in this perspective. And thus, the distance between all those little embossments end up shifting and changing as well. Their thickness shifts because the closer they get to us, as they drop down from behind Goliath, and the more that they extend into the foreground and then coil back up into the minigun, the more we will end up seeing the distance between each one of those extrusions become greater. As they recede back in space, we end up seeing the details that we're laying into these ammo belts become more compressed. That is the basic rules of perspective that need to be kept in mind and especially applied if you want to produce that depth within your drawing that makes it pop off of the page. Now, when we think about perspective drawings, we often think about interiors, or if we're thinking about exterior drawings, it's usually in the form of buildings that are conforming to the perspective that we've set up to them, block formations that adhere to the perspective grid near perfectly. But when you're dealing with a three-dimensional shape such as this, it's it's definitely not going to conform to your perspective grid in any way, shape, or form. So you're going to have to make a lot of guesstimations when it comes to drawing it up and having it look right within the scene that you've established for the rest of the character. Because when we first set out to draw Goliath up, we constructed his primary concept with a certain perspective in mind. And it wasn't just his body that needed to be drawn up to that perspective and look correct at the same time. It was also the miniguns that we placed onto his forearms. That was the first challenge. That was difficult enough to get them looking right because they are attached to a moving beast of a character. And so as he moves his arms around, even if there was some form of perspective grid that we had done up for him and that we had tried to make sure he was confined to, the moment that he moved and shifted into a brand new pose would be the moment that all our plans to make that happen would have gone to, uh, gone to shit, essentially. <laughs> Excuse my coarse language. But... So you have to be able to, as a comic book artist who is dynamic within their skill set, you've got to be able to understand the basic concepts of perspective, of course. This is a foundational drawing principle that needs to be properly understood in order to be able to give your drawings that depth and dimension we look for in captivating comic book artwork. But then you've got to graduate beyond that. You really have to be able to become competent at manipulating objects and characters and various other assets that you might include within your illustrations in three-dimensional space. You need to be able to manipulate them, turn them around, scale them up. And that goes beyond just gluing everything to a mathematically constructed grid. Turning things in space is 
It is an exercise in constantly reworking your drawing to make whatever you've incorporated into its composition look correct. And for that, there's very few tools. A perspective grid is not going to save you, but it will at least give you some idea as to what the three-dimensional space you're working in looks like. It describes the three-dimensional space that you've got to play in. And so you can start throwing in objects. You can start placing in characters, posing them, moving them. And you can at least have some kind of ability to then visualize how they might be placed and how they might look within that perspective grid that you've set up, even if the character isn't necessarily conforming to it 100%, because it very rarely will. We simply don't follow a grid within reality. Things rotate. Things move up and down. In a sense, any object which isn't static is dynamic. And so you've got to cater for that when you're working in perspective. Now, comic book, which is essentially a movie, a series of images that play out in a logical sequence that have moving characters within them and things happening. Well, then all of a sudden, you've got to start pushing your perspective skills to the next level. And that's what I found with these ammo belts here, or at least shapes like them. And I would say that probably that next level that we're talking about beyond the old perspective grid is foreshortening. Because foreshortening is just taking a three-dimensional object and making it appear as though it has been placed in space. Actually making it look 3D, like it's popping out at you, and it's pulling back. That it has that depth. And so a lot of foreshortening was applied to these MO belts. And to be able to picture how this three-dimensional strip, which is pretty much what they are, would twist and turn and fold in on itself and follow that path that I established for it from the beginning was a mental exercise and heck, even a physical exercise. Because as I said, this took a lot of time and my artistic stamina was running quite low by the end of it. You can only sit there for so long and work on subject matter that doesn't go beyond the level of interest of a minigun ammo belt. Now, the fun part about it is there's a lot of little itty-bitty details that I was placing in here, and the design itself does entail that. Now, I didn't even really know what a minigun ammo belt looked like until I looked it up in Google. And even then, it was difficult to really figure out what exactly it was going on with it. And so portions of my design that I decided to opt for within Goliath's character concept were completely made up. They were assumed. And I was hoping that I could get something that looked moderately correct, that made sense visually, which is always the challenge when it comes to this stuff. One of the other difficult things here is that as I apply the line weights to the individual embossments that are placed in along the horizontal axes of these ammo belts, is that I start noticing little flaws within it. In fact, I'd go beyond little and I'd say, major flaws. There's an underlying problem to the way in which I've decided to draw these ammo belts in in the first place. And what it's causing to happen is these unfortunate symptoms that come about because of that underlying problem. 
So I'm making small little fixes here and there, hoping that I can save it, praying that I don't have to erase these MO belts and completely start again, hoping with all my heart that I've made the right call. But I know deep down somewhere, even at this point, that I'm probably just going to have to redo them completely. And oftentimes, if you have made it quite a long distance into your illustration and you're constantly having to fix portions of it, sometimes, not all times, but sometimes it can be because there is an underlying problem within the foundations. And you can see me here readjusting the thickness of this ammo belt by erasing an entire side of it and then drawing those embossed grooves back in. And it's causing me to spend so much more time on it. If only I had nailed that thickness right off the bat, I could have avoided all this. And I'll probably have to go back and reweight those little extrusions again, making sure the line work is just the way that I want it until I notice that next issue that needs to be attended to. And then, boom, a whole lot of erasing will yet again happen, as you can see here. I'm going back and I'm erasing again and again and again trying to readjust the thickness of that ammo belt. But what is it really? What is the fundamental problem that keeps on causing me to go back and make these little tweaks? Well, I'll tell you, it's pretty much the way in which I've got it twisting around. The overall basic form of these ammo belts are essentially flawed. And they're just not curving. They're not twisting. They're not following the shape I want them to follow in the correct way. I haven't manipulated them right. And so I will need to go back and I'll need to rehash this. And it's not going to be fun. But it's something that I guess you have to bite the bullet with sometimes. And it hurts to begin with. It really, really does. You put so much work into something and the last thing you want to do is go back and take another shot at it throughout all the progress that you've made on it thus far and then have to redo that exact same thing again. Even at that point when your interest in the subject matter is already dwindling you got to go back and you got to just re, re-go back over the same tracks that you've already gone through. But you know what? When you do make that call and you find that you, you just, you, you somewhere find within it yourself to be able to suck it back up and keep on going and have another go at it, it's not so bad. A lot of the time, it's the pre-meditation. It's the thinking about it beforehand. Dwelling on the fact that you might have to completely rehash on something that you spent so much time doing in the first place. That's the most difficult part. That's the torturous part. But once you just erase the whole damn thing, and then you get stuck back into it straight away, with a minimal amount of time contemplating it in between, you'll find that you click back into the zone fairly fast. You become engaged. And you know what? It's very rare for me to not do a better job the second time around than the first time I took a crack at it. And it's always worth it. I'm always so happy that I did go back and I did redo that thing that was bugging me, even if it was a major issue. Now, of course, ideally, it would have been quite nice to have noticed and made the realization that I did have to completely erase these ammo belts and make sure that their basic underlying structure was shaped 
in the correct way before I started adding in these line weights and then the rendering later on. That would have been real nice. But sometimes you commit and you got to be able to have the ability to commit in order to complete an illustration in the first place. Because going all the way through and seeing a comic book illustration through to the end, not everybody has the capability of doing. It's so easy to start something. You know, we're always filled with these ideas popping off inside our imagination. And of course, it's easy for us to jump from one of them to the other. But what really allows you to be able to make any of them and see any of them through to completion, to actually be able to reach a point where you're sitting there looking at that idea in front of you, holding it, putting it up on the wall, on display. What allows that to ever happen in the first place is your ability to see it through to the end, through commitment, through dedication, through sitting there and grinding it out hour after hour and doing what it takes. And part of that commitment, at least for me, is fixing the errors of my ways throughout the progression of that illustration. Otherwise, I'm just not satisfied with it. I'm sitting there looking at it on the wall, and I can see every single little itty-bitty mistake that I couldn't have been bothered changing. That's much worse for me than than not getting the illustration done in the first place. If I'm going to do it, if I'm going to see it through to the end, then it must be realized to its greatest potential, to the epitome of what I know that it can be. So here I'm, again, I'm fixing little itty bitty mistakes. I'm making these minute changes that I think are going to improve and make me feel better about these minigun ammo belts. But it just doesn't end up happening that way. Am I reapplying those line weights, retracking constantly? I'm flipping the image now, trying to figure it out once again because I can I sense that there's a problem. And sometimes that's the thing. All you can do is sense that something is amiss, that something is just not quite working right. And so you do make these little changes and these little tweaks. It's, it's an exploration of the potential mistake, the potential underlying mistake and what exactly it could be that's throwing everything else off. And eventually I'm just like, you know what, stuff it, I'm going to start again. And that's exactly what you can see me doing here, going back to the drawing board. Because I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it if I just left it as is. I wouldn't feel right about that, even though I was hired to create this concept for Rob Arnold's Replicator comic book. For me, if I'm going to do a job for somebody, I've got to do it right. Even if they're paying me a set amount of money and it's going to take me much, much longer than I initially anticipated to finish off a job, I will go that extra mile because it's important to me. And it means that I'm about to learn a valuable lesson here. Every mistake you make, every time you got to go back to the drawing board, just like I'm doing here, that's an opportunity to learn. And what does learning allow you to do? If you're a comic book artist who is committed, who is dedicated to their craft, well, it allows you to progress to that next level within your comic art skill set. It allows you to evolve as an artist. I mean, that's how anything evolves, is through this, this grueling diversity, you know, when things don't go to plan. You learn very little through your successes. It is through the mishaps along the way that you are always, without fail, 
going to learn the most, but you do have to be aware of when things are going wrong, which is a whole other skill in and of itself, because some people are blind to the flaws within their own work. Maybe they don't like to see or acknowledge that there's flaws within their work. You know, they just think they're the best and that's it. No one can argue with them. Very dangerous place to be for an artist because you never evolve, you never grow, and you never learn. You never allow yourself to. You don't allow yourself to see through your own matrix of supremism in order to actually become the artist that you potentially could be if you opened yourself up to a little bit of critique once in a while. And what you can see me doing here as I lay in the basic three-dimensional shape for the minigun ammo belt once more, is I'm adding in these guidelines that run across it. Those guidelines are going to allow me, as I divide them up, to make sure that when I do add in the ammo belt details, those embossed extrusions that I pulled out across them before, it'll allow me to make sure that they are indeed drawn up in the proper perspective. Because let me tell you, at this point, I do not want to go through the horrible process of retweaking and maybe completely redoing these MO belts all over again. This is the last time you get one last chance, Clayton, to see this through. And, uh, and that's exactly what I did. So now I'm going through and I'm just dividing those guidelines up more and more, making sure that they are exactly right. And this is why the initial stages, the lay-in of any illustration that is to ultimately be successful is so, so important. Because this is where all the planning is done. This is the stage at the very beginning that will eventually make or break your artwork. So you've got to pay attention to it. It's not beautiful. It's quite ugly. It doesn't have the, the carefully placed in and balanced out line weights and rendering and all those other pretty details, the icing on top. But it is essential to an illustration that is going to work, that is going to be absent of issues later on down the track and mistakes in the final presentation. And I always say, the audience may not know why your artwork doesn't quite look right, but they'll definitely know that something is off. We all have eyes. We all live in a world that we occupy within a three-dimensional space that conforms to perspective, that is built on very much the same rules that we've used, that we've created in order to be able to draw, to create the illusion on a 2D piece of paper of a three-dimensional space. And so what we must do in order to make sure that our audience is tricked, because that's what we're doing. We're tricking them. This is very much a, uh, uh, this is a show. We're putting on a show for them. We're creating in the illusion of three-dimensional space on this piece of paper. But we've got to be able to master the tools within our, our artistic arsenal in order to be able to properly do that. Because your audience, regardless of their experience as an artist, are still going to know when you haven't quite laid in the foundations of your illustration correctly. And they will sense the resulting flaws within it. So now I'm carefully going back over the top of this brand new blueprint that I've created for the minigun ammo belt. And I'm laying in the lines trying to keep them neat, trying to keep them tidy. At this point, I'm being extremely precious about my minigun ammo belts. And I've also gone back and I've had another look 
at the reference material that I have collected for the MO belts just to make sure that all of these divisions that I'm adding in to the strip that will serve as the foundations for our MO belt are all sized up accurately, that they're all placed in at the correct thickness. Now, of course, we are drawing up a completely fictional, made-up character here who inherently looks pretty unrealistic. But why does he pass for reality? Or why could he pass for reality? What brings into light the comprehension that maybe this particular character could actually exist? Well, it's his functionality, and it is the associations, even though there may not be a whole lot of them, to the real world that we've incorporated into his design. Now, to explain what I'm talking about there in clearer terms, that would be assets such as the minigun, which is attached to his forearm. Now, of course, it's very unrealistic to consider that a money a minigun, not a money gun, a money gun would be nice though. Uh, so if you know where to get one, just let me know. But uh, a minigun being attached to the forearms of a character, even if he is this big, is realistic and probably even physically impossible. Possible, unrealistic, and physically impossible. It's just probably not going to work. However, why does it kind of look like it could work? Well, the reason for that is because the minigun itself kind of still looks like a minigun. You can look at it and get that it's a minigun. You can look at the, uh, the minigun ammo belts and they actually kind of do look like minigun ammo belts. If you do a quick Google of a minigun or minigun ammo belt, you will see that they look similar, maybe not 100% accurate to the drawing, the depiction that I have illustrated here, but there are similarities there. There's associations there, visual ones that your audience is going to hook into that they will look at and they'll get. They're like, okay, that's a minigun and that's an ammo belt. Okay, I get that. And then if you look at Goliath himself, well, even though he's a beastly, unrealistic, but very cool-looking character, he still has an anatomical structure that somewhat adheres to the anatomical structure of any other human being. We can see his deltoids there. We can see his pecs and his abdominal muscles. We can see his biceps. And we can see that the structure of his forearms is very similar to the structure, at least in the way in which the muscles within it are structured of any other forearm. And so even though there's a slight unrealistic decision that's been made within his design to attach these miniguns to his forearms, the forearms and the miniguns themselves look fairly realistic. They look correct. And so what we end up entering into is the concept of the rule of cool. And the rule of cool is simply that if something looks cool enough, people will tend to not worry so much about the inaccuracies as associated to reality. They won't so much focus in on the impossibilities that may be scattered throughout your character concept. And they'll sweep them under the rug in a sense, or at least their perception will. Because if the character looks like they could work, if they look functional. In other words, if they look like they could move, as the minigun looks like it could shoot bullets, which hopefully at this point it does because I've spent a long time on these ammo belts, then it's possible. It will be possible. 
Not to mention the fact that we've dressed this character up with very intricate detail. We've shaded it. We've lit it accurately. We've made sure that we've placed everything within perspective to the best of our ability. If you combine all of these these elements within our illustration, well, it all adds up to one heck of a very cool, but also very realistic, or at least possible as potentially being realistic, piece of comic book art. So it's something to keep in mind, and something that hopefully will help you out, because when it comes to comics, I mean, let's face it, they're not exactly the most realistic genre of storytelling medium that uh, you could be an illustrator for. So as a comic book artist, it is really your job to try to, as much as you possibly can, make sure that when your audience looks at a comic book sequence that you've illustrated or a comic book cover, there's of course story and whatnot coming through, but also you just, you want to make it look convincing. You got to make it look believable because we are always trying to suspend disbelief. That's the whole point here. That's why we go to so much trouble of trying to make sure everything conforms to perspective, that everything looks right, that everything's lit accurately that all the muscles are placed into the right areas and sized appropriately, that everything is proportionally accurate in association with one another, relative to one another. That's why we go to so much trouble to master these drawing principles that we harp on about, because it suspends disbelief. And whether you're designing a character for a comic book or a video game or a movie... It's something that you need to keep in mind because as the character designer or the environment designer or the assets designer, the weaponry designer, you got to make sure that when all the 3D modelers start tackling it or all your fellow comic book illustrators who are responsible for illust- for actually taking your character design and putting it into the book itself – drawing up the panels and making sure that those panels flow in a logical sequence with your character in them, it's important that that character is going to make sense as a design because they're going to be working off of it. They're going to be following the exact blueprint for your character that you laid out. That's the whole point of creating a character concept in the first place. And it is why I love character design so much, because you get to think about this stuff. You get to think about the functionality of the character. You get to start considering, well, if the story surrounding this character is as such then they need to look a certain way. If they come from a particular time, that they need to look as though they are from that time period. If they come from a certain culture, then you've got to dress them up in a way within their costuming that makes them appear as though they belong to that culture. If they're an angry character, if they're a brooding character, then the way in which you have them move and express themselves must be congruent to their temperament, to their mood, to their attitude, to their personality. Because this is all we've got to play with, is the visuals here, the visual communication that allows that character to show their emotions and their personality and whatnot, where they're from, when they're from, on the surface. And it all gets folded up into a nice, neat little bundle called a character concept. And, uh, yeah, i I got to say that When it came to Goliath's character concept, I was pretty excited to work on it, to be honest. When uh, Rob Arnold gave me the brief for this one, all he wanted was this giant, massive conglomeration of of tech and muscle with miniguns attached to his forearms. I mean, what's not to love? So now we've got the hardest part of these miniguns figured out. 
everything looks reasonably lined up in the perspective that I want it to be in, it's looking right. You could observe these minigun ammo belts and go, hey, you know what? I can see how they're twisting, how they're coiling out from the sides of the miniguns and into the back of Goliath. I get it now. I understand what kind of shape we're dealing with and the perspective that it's being presented in. So now we are at the stage of the baking process where we are now placing on the icing. Okay, this is the fun part. Now we've just got to figure out, well, all right, how do we shade this form now? What kind of details are we going to be dealing with? How do we make those little intricacies that we've incorporated into the minigun ammo belts themselves really pop visually? And so this, of course, is going to come down to the way in which I weight those details the major outlines, how I suggest shadows that may be cast around the intricate surface textures and materials, and again, those details that I'm going to attempt to place into and along the ammo belts. And you can see how there's this immediate increase of three-dimensionality of depth within even just those little details as I do begin adding in those line weights. And it's amazing how just such a small little technique like line weighting can add so much to your comic book art. If you're not using line weights yet, do yourself a favor and give them a crack. You'll notice an immediate shift within the quality of your art. It is going to take it to a whole other level. I say this a lot, but the moment that I started using line weights, my professionalism that was perceived within the art that I was creating completely leveled up. At least for me, I was looking at my work and I was going, damn, like, okay, I'm it looks much less amateurish than what it did before. So now I'm going in and we've got the shadows placed around the ammo belts at this point. We've also added in the line weights. And now it's time to progress on to the rendering. And I'm only very, very lightly adding in some hatches along the sides of these ammo belts at this point. And I'm going to try and make it so that they get lighter and finer to attempt a gradation of tone, where we will see those hatches produce a darker or a gradually darker value as the ammo belt wraps up around the back of Goliath. Now, why is that? Well, it's because there will be somewhat of a shadow which is cast down along the ammo belt, Goliath's shadow to be exact. If we observe and take note of where the primary light source is within the scene and from what direction it is projecting down onto Goliath from, then we can assume that there should be a fairly dense drop shadow that is being cast off Goliath and on to the ammo belt that we're working on currently. Now, of course, the cast shadow isn't really all that dense. Um, you can see there that all I've really opted for toward the top of the ammo belt as it leads up into Goliath is just some slightly darker rendering. And the reason as to why I vary the rendering somewhat is just to create a variation within the tone in an attempt to produce a greater amount of depth. It creates this, this three-dimensional variety, I guess you could say. And you're describing the way in which not only this shape is being shaded, 
within the scene, but also its material as well, how reflective it is. So now we'll take our attention over to the other MO belt. Once more, we're just tweaking those line weights, making sure that they're balanced and placed in at the right thickness, the right heaviness, in order to really accentuate their contours and the shape of the MO belt itself. And I'm adding some very subtle rendering along the side there once more. Trying to really get those embossments to pop now. Even though they're the tiniest details ever, it is the little things that really count in the end. You may not notice it at first, even as the viewer, as the audience that will ultimately be observing the finished artwork. But every little detail does add to the whole and it will come together to increase the overall quality of that final presentation, just in the same way that the audience doesn't necessarily know what's off about your artwork, but still senses that there might be an issue within it, they also don't really know why your artwork looks so awesome sometimes. They couldn't tell you. They couldn't acknowledge necessarily that it's because of the line weights or it's because of the way in which you've described the materials and, and, and made that readable image by balancing out the values just right because they wouldn't know. They, they don't know what goes into an illustration. It's kind of sad for us as the artists, of course, but the point is, is that we're creating an enjoyable experience for the end observer. Now, if you were to go back and look at the initial MO belts that I illustrated for Goliath here, you'd notice that there's a few minor adjustments that I've made, but they're really not all that different. It was a very slight tweak. But the one thing, if you're looking closely, closely that you will agree with me on, is that the outcome is much better. That even though it was the smallest little difference in the outcome, the quality that we've managed to achieve within Goliath's concept, it is that little bit better. And... That makes me, as the artist, much more satisfied with the work that I'm producing. Oftentimes, we're our own worst critic. I've said it many, many times before. And it's hard for me to sleep at night if I, if I know that I just... I didn't put all I had into it. I let that little mistake slip and I knew I could have fixed it if I just, if I just had have attended to it. And so I try not to be lazy with my artwork. I know that laziness is a habit. And if I'm lazy on one artwork, then I'm probably going to be lazy and let things slide on the next one, which is certainly a terrible habit to get into as a comic book artist. This is how when you become a pro, an elite, you end up sliding backwards just a little bit enough to, to have the resulting lowered quality within your art become noticeable. And it's unfortunate to see that, especially within an artist who you've been following, who inspires you, who you respect. And why do they let it slide? Well, it's simply because maybe they've been working as a professional artist for quite a long time. Decades, maybe. And the work that they do for the companies that they've been employed at or the clients that they have, they're just not all that into. And so they do the job, but they do it just to get it done. They want to get it done on time. They're often forced to work to a deadline, which means they they you know, they get to rush some parts. They can't just go back and redo a completely new ammo belt for their character, as I have done for Goliath. He's a very lucky character to to have me as the artist. 
behind his concept. But not all artists can do that. Some artists, if they screw it up the first time around, they just have to eat it. they got to live with that. And when that comic book goes to print, every time they flip through it, they're going to see those flaws. That's really, really difficult for me to accept as an artist. And one of the reasons as to why I really enjoy working for myself, I know maybe I don't produce as much work as a result, but that is, that's fine for me. I'm a, I'm a quality over quantity type of guy. And so a lot of the time, because I can't really, as I mentioned before, skimp on the effort that I put into the artwork I create even for my clients, I prefer to work for myself because I'm going to end up spending just as long on a client's work as I will on my own work, regardless of the amount of money that I'm being paid. And usually the amount of money that I'm being paid isn't really justified for the amount of time that I'm spending on it on it or the other way around. The amount of time I'm spending on it isn't really justified for the pay that I'm receiving to do that job. And so I would just I would rather put the effort into my own stuff and and hopefully make a quid doing that uh, rather than the other alternatives that are out there. But you've got to choose your own path as an artist. And there are a lot of avenues that you can go down as a comic book illustrator. You just got to decide which one is going to be most enjoyable for you. And heck, that may mean that you're going to be the type of comic book artist who just does it as a hobby. And if you do it as a hobby, you know what? There's no shame in that. Because working as a comic book artist full time as a career option, well, that can be a really draining, soulless exercise. And it can somewhat dirty your passion for the art form. It can diminish the ambition that you once had to become that great illustrator that you dreamt of being. It can destroy the amount of passion that you have for the craft. It's unfortunate, but for some, this certainly happens. This is a feeling that I felt working in the games industry when I had my bout there for a while. You know, I'd get in a studio, I'd have all this ability under my belt. I knew how to 3D model, how to create scenes and, and video game levels, how to create characters. I knew how to design them, of course. But you know what? When I, I was actually sitting in the studio, I wasn't enjoying it. I'd be there for about a week before I got tired of it. It just was not fun. It wasn't for me. I thought it was, but it wasn't. And so... The dream, oftentimes, is somewhat underwhelming once you get there, once you achieve it. If it's the right dream, hopefully that won't be the case. Hopefully you will be exactly where you're supposed to be. But I quickly found out that I preferred comic book art, firstly, to video games. And I really, really like doing art just for myself. The other thing is, of course, is that for a very long time, I decided to teach the comic art craft. And that's what I enjoyed for a while. That's how I made my, my weekly salary. I'm a terrible businessman, believe it or not, which is why I take so long on my artwork. If I cared about money, I'd certainly be smashing these out a lot faster than I do. So I'm rendering this, this final ammo belt out. As you can see, we're getting those last hatches placed in there, trying to really get those details, those extrusions that I've placed in around the ammo belt to stand out a little bit more, to read accurately. You know, I don't want them getting lost within the details. As we add in these much finer hatches, that could very easily happen. So I've got to emphasize them by increasing their line weights in some areas. And when you want to create that extra emphasis, line weights are a fantastic tool that you've got at your disposal to be able to do that. I use line weights to add emphasis to all of the primary focal points within my illustration when need be. It's a go-to option. 
and certainly one that I take full advantage of, especially because my work is oftentimes extremely detailed. And when you're adding in that much detail, it's easy to visually get lost within them for not just you as the artist, but also the audience once again. And this goes into the subject of making sure that your art is readable, that it's clear and easy to understand, that it's not visually indecipherable. Line weights are a great way of avoiding that. And also I find shadow as well can be used to significantly break up a densely detailed illustration. So use that as well in combination with line weights and of course rendering. It's not necessarily a matter of figuring out how often you should be using rendering or shadows. You can use it as much as you want. You can add those line weights in as much as you like. It's just a matter of how much and where do you add them in. Because there should always be an end goal with every decision that you make throughout the production of your comic book illustration. Think about what that is and let that determine the decisions that you make. And you'll find that uh, things go a whole lot more smoothly. So we're adding in those finishing touches, a little bit more shadow, few more hatches, a touch of line weight in just the right area, just the right amount. And that is a wrap for today's tutorial. So I hope that you learned a lot here. Mostly, I want you to know that when it comes to your artwork, regardless of the amount of times that you may have to erase and redo something, it is worth it, not just for the final presentation of your illustration and the additional quality that it's going to have as a result of your efforts to go back and do the right thing, to correct those mistakes, but it's also going to be extremely beneficial for your growth as a comic book artist. It's going to allow you to learn and thus level up. That's it for today. If you enjoyed this tutorial, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, you'll find a ton of written tutorials, video tutorials, of course. We've even got a podcast. And when you're ready to take your comic art skill set to the next level, I highly suggest you have a browse through our store. You'll find a whole selection of premium courses and classes by some of the most skilled and talented instructors out there right now. So I hope that you'll check that out. And until next time, keep on drawing.